Today's gospel reading comes from the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 15 through 27. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For it is the inheritance that depends on the law. Then, for if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For it is a law had been for a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under control of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith, Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed, so that the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under guardian. God grants us freedom to fail. This is great news, but I really wish I didn't need it. I, like many people, strive to do what is right. And I'm sure for those of you who know me well, know that I am a rule follower pretty much to a T. Breaking the rules sends me into an anxious mess. Let me just give you an example. When I was about six years old, one of my favorite toys was our talk and play. And what's probably considered an ancient artifact by today's standards, it was the coolest piece of technology we owned. The talk and play was an interactive cassette player that read books on tape. The interactive part came through four color-coded buttons red, yellow, green, and blue. It provided us with hours of educational entertainment, reading along with some of our favorite characters from the 1980s. One particular favorite book of mine was titled Lovable Furry Old Grover and Please Don't Push the Red Button, where, as per usual, Grover finds himself in a bit of a predicament and it was up to the reader, me, to help him restore order. And the only way to do that was to read the entire book and never push the red button. I probably read that book 50 times or more and have never pushed the red button. My dad and sister would try to tempt me, but I never caved. I followed the rules, never wanting to face the terrible consequences looming from disobeying Grover's pleas. Now let's fast forward to adulthood and my rule following box checking tendencies are still going strong. As a teacher, I have to do regular evaluations from the teacher, um, from my administrators using Ohio's teacher evaluation system. And through observations, conferences, and evidence collection, I am rated on a scale, which a rub I'm rated through a rubric which places me on a scale labeling me as ineffective, developing, skilled, or accomplished. Now maybe I can thank my high school English teachers, or maybe it's something innate, but I actually like a rubric. I want to know exactly what I need to do for maximum points. My focus is on accomplished. I don't want to do just enough. I want to do the best I possibly can. But what if that rubric, rubric is wrong? Or what if someone's trying to tell us it is, and we either don't know it or we're just not listening? It's like in our gospel lesson. Paul's letter 
is to the people in Galatia, which is now where the country of Turkey is located. And he's trying to tell them just that. Many of them were Gentiles who had become Christians. But after Paul left, some Jewish leaders came back and told them that they would not be part of God's people unless they were circumcised under Jewish law. It angered Paul that the leaders were telling them things that weren't true, and it saddened him that these Christians were believing it. He wanted them to understand that Christ's sacrifice of dying on the cross was enough. We didn't need to strictly adhere to any other litany of rules just or to receive eternal salvation. This letter is a shorter version of the message in Romans. Paul explains the, leg the, the legalities, excuse me, of a contract, showing how Christ, Christ brought freedom from, not bondage to, the Jewish law. Christians um, are saved from their sins by faith alone in Christ. They are free to live by the law of love and not under the law of Moses. Paul explains that God's promise to Abraham predates the Ten Commandments and any other law or stipulations that they're trying to hold one another to. We read it in Genesis chapter 13, 15. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. And then again in Genesis 24, 7 it says, the Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me an oath, saying, to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. Now, when I think of Abraham, I think of the song, Father Abraham. I'm sure many of you know it. Um, I can still remember Linda Heidinger leading us and singing it during our opening in Sunday school growing up, and I always was wondering about his many sons. Now, I wondered, like, how many was many? Was it more than the ten that my great-grandparents had? Because certainly that was many. So is that how many they were talking to? But here, or talking about, but here, it's only one offspring, one descendant. Jesus. And this is roughly 42 generations after this covenant was given. And that depends on which gospel um, you read, but it's about that many. Um, furthermore, he's trying to make it unequivocally clear that the laws created more than 400 years after this contract was made between God and Abraham cannot and will never supersede it. So if that's the case and Jesus is the answer, then why do we need the rules that Moses is talking about anyway? In Exodus, we learn God sent an angel to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the Jewish people were to follow those laws. So from Exodus um, chapter 19, verses 5 through 8, it says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Now Exodus and Moses don't just lay out the Ten Commandments. There are laws for idols and altars, owning Hebrew servants, personal injury, protection of property, social responsibility, justice and mercy, the Sabbath, and annual festivals of celebration. And when receiving those notification, the notification of these laws, the Jewish people responded in unison to Moses, promising to follow God's law more than once throughout these chapters. Yet, the people failed and continued to disobey. Acts 7.53 states, You who have received the law that was given through the angels, but have not obeyed it. God knew that laws were necessary to maintain safety and order for those on earth. He knew humankind would fail, but also knew that some sort of guidelines would help. Clearly, we are still learning these lessons. More than 2,000 years later, 
It seems there are more rules and regulations on practically everything we use than ever before. Gone are the days of merry-go-rounds and 10-foot metal slides rooted in concrete from playgrounds. Penalties for distracted or impaired driving are becoming more strict and so forth. In a secular world, people are going to ignore the laws and the rules and they are going to do foolish or dangerous things. Therefore, new laws and regulations get created. Yet, they are there to keep us safe. God's laws outlined in the Old Testament were too. In this past Sunday's second reading, we heard again of Paul explaining this time to the Romans that we have been justified through faith in Christ Jesus' blood, which gives us access to grace, and reconciliation for our sins, our failures. Later in that sermon, in the sermon, Pastor Penty reminded us that Jesus lived his life to a higher standard, one that we should try, strive to um, do as well. It's one that would make the world a better place and allow for us to live a more honorable life, he explained. But we're not Jesus. We will fall short. We will fail. However, that's okay. God already knew that and had a plan. The remaining few verses of this chapter in Galatians were included in the text from Charlie's sermon last week, but I think it's worth repeating. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Friends, we can fail and still have eternal life. God's laws were put into place to keep us safe and to allow for a better earthly existence while we are here, but perfection is not required. Making sure all the boxes under accomplished are checked is not the answer. We can even push the red button. Our shortcomings will not keep us from being God's people. So as long as we have faith in him, we will become his children and receive his grace, forgiveness, and eternal life through Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It's just that simple.